My story kind of starts with this sampler. And this is a sampler that belongs to the Sacco Museum. And it's been in our collection since the early 1960s. And about, um, gosh, about eight years ago now, I wanted to convince um, our current mu our museum director then, the one that was there then, that, that we should have a, a, an exhibition of schoolgirl embroidery. And I was convinced that it would really, really, you know, bring in a good audience and it would be very entertaining. And mm -hmm. both my um, museum director and my collections manager who have moved on since then, were very skeptical that anybody would be interested in samplers. And, and I was trying to argue that samplers often have interesting stories connected to them. And this sampler, we didn't really know much about it, but we presumed that it was made by a girl who had probably grown up in Saco. So I said I would run over to the library and find out a little bit more about Sally Cochran. And when I went over to the library and got up in the main history room and did some research, I found that Sally was not from Sacco at all, that we didn't have any records for her. And so usually when I'm kind of doing some genealogy things, my next resource is just to Google the person and see if they come up, because that can be a very quick and easy cheat. And when I Googled Sally Cochran, I found out that she had been murdered in 1833 when she was 27 years old by her husband's hired farmhand, Abraham Prescott. And that seemed like quite a story. That was a lot more of a story than I expected that I would find. So Sally Cochran was living in Londonderry, New Hampshire when she stitched this sampler in 1818. And she was a student at the Pinkerton Academy which was at that time a private academy that served both, both boys and girls, which was a fairly unusual model for an academy. The academies were typically schools that kids went to to be educated after they had sort of aged out of their local district schools. And they were sort of, for boys, they might be the step before college. And for girls, they often functioned as more of a finishing school where they could hone their artistic talents. They might learn some academic subjects at the better schools, and they certainly would have done some kind of fine stitchery. And this is very fine stitchery. Mm. The strange thing is the Pinkerton Academy remains open even now and is the public high school in Londonderry. Um, so after Sally stitched this sampler when she was 13, it was probably hung on her parents' wall, and it would kind of subtly advertise to any young men that might visit the house that Sally was a talented young woman and that she had all the kind of skills that would make her marriageable. You know, she would be a good person to marry because she could do the kind of work that she ought to be able to do around her house. So around the time that she finished this sampler, her parents packed up and moved to Pembroke, New Hampshire, which was, is a couple of towns over from Londonderry. Pembroke is on the Eastern side of Concord, the state capital, and it's kind of a farming community, uh, even now, a bedroom community now for Concord, but, but definitely is a farming community. And they settled on a Cochrane farm. And a few years later, Sally married her first cousin, Chauncey Cochran. It wasn't at all unusual at that time to marry a cousin. There were a lot of good reasons to marry your cousin. And one of those was that it helped to keep um, possessions in the family. You know, they wouldn't get inherited out. And uh, Chauncey was living on the farm that had been his father's. His father had built a house there in the 1790s and, um, Chauncey's father died unexpectedly when he was 17 years old. And so he seems to have inherited the family farm. His father died without a will. And he was living on the farm with his mother, Latisse. And so Sally, when she got married, she only moved about 10 houses up the road from where her parents lived into Chauncey's farm. Um, So this is kind of a map of what is now called North Pembroke Road in, in uh, Pembroke, New Hampshire. And um, you can see Great Brook running down the side here and the Chauncey Cochran household is right here. And he actually was in, in a small cluster of houses and right across the street from him was the house of James Cochran. And James was Chauncey's younger brother. Mm. And James just happened to be married to Sally's younger sister, Mary Jane. Mm. 
So they were all kind of living there in the same neighborhood. Um, so early on when they got married, Sally probably would have helped Chauncey with, you know, different farm chores. She wouldn't have done the heavy farming work, but she might have helped him like with weeding the vegetable garden and different things like that. But about 1830, she gave birth to her first child. And at that point, Chauncey needed to hire out some farm help. So he hired a 15 year old farm hand named Abraham Prescott. The Cochrans had had been for generations not well to do, but surf, certainly comfortably well off. The, the, the boys in the family all got a little higher education. They were all landowners um, and they just they, they held government positions in town. They were generally kind of if there had been railroad tracks at that point, they were from one side of the railroad tracks. And Abraham Prescott was very definitely from the other side of the railroad tracks but there were no railroads, so ignore that. Um, so Abraham's family had actually been in America longer than the Cochran's had been there. They, they had settled in America in the mid 17th century. And initially they too had been very well off. But when you looked at Abraham's particular forebears, each generation going up, um, he had been the son of one of the youngest sons in the family. So in each generation, his forebear didn't inherit any kind of property. And with each generation, they seemed to become progressively less successful. And that sort of culminated with Abraham's grandfather, who was also named Abraham. And that man was uh, both had issues with drunkenness and probably with some kind of mental illness. And he sort of tended to roam the neighborhood when he was having his spells, which was mm -hmm. often a way to handle mm -hmm. mentally ill people in the 18th century. And he, he had a very large family and he didn't provide well for the family. So Chauncey's father doesn't seem to have ever owned any land or anything like that. And he too had quite a few children. So Abraham was sent out to work at a fairly early age um, wait a minute. Abraham um, moved in to the Cochrane residence, which wasn't at all unusual. In the summertime, he may have even slept in the barn, but definitely in the wintertime, he was sleeping in the house with the family. And he was a good worker. Everybody agreed that he was a good worker. But Abraham had some issues. One of his issues was that he couldn't seem to make eye contact with anybody. And another issue was that he couldn't really carry on a conversation. He wouldn't carry on a conversation. And a third issue was that a number of people had seen him just ferociously beating the cattle. And Chauncey had had to speak to Abraham time after time about his problems with the cattle. Uh, and when, when he would do that, Abraham would kind of look down and, and look angry and not really seem too repentant about the whole thing. And then the next time the cattle annoyed him, he would beat them again. However, the Cochran's had two little children, two toddlers, and he was perfectly kind to the children. And as uh, Chauncey said, he had known him to go to get water instead of my wife after she had started for it. And this is a picture I took in 18, I mean, in uh, 2012, when I first went over to where the Pembroke, the Cochrane Farm had once been. It's been gone now for probably 100 years. This is probably their original well, and it too is gone now. So things were going along pretty well until the night of January 6th, 1833. That night, Abraham went to bed a little earlier than the rest of the family because he was going to have to do some, some kind of hard work in the morning. And about midnight, give or take, he got up. It was quite a cold night being January. And he rekindled the fire in the big fireplace in, in their main room. And then he went into the Cochran's bedchamber and he took a buffalo robe that they had in there and he brought that back out and he wrapped up in, inside the buffalo robe and sat down in front of the fire. And uh, Abraham said that he must have then fallen asleep. And at some point after he fell asleep, he got up again and he lit a candle and he went out through the house into the back woodshed and he came back with an axe. 
and he let himself back into the Cochrane's bedroom, and then he began to beat them with the axe. He must have beaten them with the blunt side of the axe because he didn't actually kill either of them, but he beat them unconscious. And when he was done doing that, he took the axe outside and dropped it in the snow. And then he went back inside and he went to the bedchamber of Chauncey's mother, Latisse, and he woke her up and he said he didn't know but what that he had killed Chauncey and Sally with an axe while he was sleepwalking. So Latisse probably did the only wise thing. She sent him out of the house. She sent him to get help from the neighbors. She didn't send him to her son's house across the street, though, and that was probably mm -hmm. no mistake because she didn't want to lose both her sons. And when the neighbors had all gathered, they went for the doctor, and it was hours before the Cochrans recovered consciousness, but they did recover. After that January transaction, Chauncey went to see Abraham's parents and asked them if he had any, any prior problems with sleepwalking, and they said no, no, he'd never done anything like that. And they gave it seemingly a lot of thought, and then they decided that they would keep Abraham on in their family, mm. which I think it's very easy from this direction looking back to know that that was a very stupid mistake to make. And it's, it's possible they thought they knew him really well. He'd been living with them for three years now, and they had watched him probably grow from kind of a, a gawky young teen into, you know, a little bit more older adult. And they just believed that they knew everything about him. So then about five months goes by and it's a sunny Sunday morning in June, and it's been a very rainy spring. So a sunny day on a weekend is a pretty cool thing to have. And Chauncey is sitting in a room that they call the clock room because they're one of the few people to have a clock at that point. And um, he's reading the record of a court trial. And it's the trial of the Reverend Avery of, of uh, Bristol, Rhode Island, who is accused of murdering a young mill girl, Sarah Marie Cornell, whom he, she said, had gotten pregnant. And she was found hanging by the kind of post that you stick in the ground to stack your hay around a, a few miles from where she lived on a cold winter night. And this trial has just been the story in the news for months, which is a new development in New England. This is, you know, when they first really start to cover salacious stories, and this is a particularly salacious story since Avery is a Baptist minister and it, you know, just doesn't seem like the kind of thing that the guy should do, married and with children of his own. So Abraham comes in and asks Chauncey if he wants to go picking strawberries with Sally, and he says no, he's borrowed this account of the trial and he wants to read it, so he's not going to go, but it's okay if Sally goes. So Sally is probably dressed, you know, dressed up for Sunday. She's probably dressed in one of her nicer gowns, and she probably changes that out for a cotton gown, but Sally would have been wearing first a chemise, which was kind of like a, a thing that, almost like a slip that kind of hung down to near your knees, was probably made of linen. And over the chemise, she would have had a corset. And over the corset, she would have worn two couple of nice, thickly gathered petticoats to make the skirt of her dress stand out nicely. And then she would have had a dress with big puffy sleeves because that was the style in 1833. And people, you know, women really tried to follow the style. She had long hair and she had her hair fastened up with a tortoiseshell comb. And then before she went outside to pick strawberries, she put on her calash, which was a kind of a collapsible bonnet. And the calash had reeds that ran through like pockets on the inside of the bonnet that made it kind of stand out above her hair, not get caught on her comb or anything like that. And she would have tied her calash with its nice wide satin ribbons under her chin because she was going to be picking strawberries. She didn't want it to fall off. You wore it tied. So um, she gets all fixed up. She puts on her shoes and they head out the door. And this is kind of a drawing of the Cochrane Farm. The Cochrane Farm was, was quite close to the edge of the dirt lane. 
and behind it there was a little L and then there was a barn and behind the barn the land began to slope off and it sloped off sort of gently at first but if you got far enough away from the house down by the brook which I would say was probably a couple of football fields away then it began to slope very, very steeply, steeply enough that it was kind of almost hard to walk down or up that slope. And at the very bottom of that slope was a little field where Chauncey and Abraham had been working a couple of weeks ago and they were cutting brush and kind of building a rail fence down there. Um, so Chauncey expected that they would pick strawberries up near the house, which would have been in full view of all those houses I showed you on the other map. But in fact, they started down the hill. And in about uh, 2012, a developer bought the Pembroke land and he was gonna put a subdivision in there. And he cleared the woods all the way down the hill. So that's what you see here. Um, I'll talk later about what has happened since. So they started down the hill and eventually ended up in a field at the very bottom of the hill um, next to the pond, next to the stream. Um, it was a very isolated spot, but not completely isolated. People did go there to pick strawberries from time to time and neighbors were familiar with that, but it wasn't, you know, it was definitely wasn't in the view of any house and was a place that um, Abraham was very familiar with. So I'm gonna just read you uh, about a page and a half of the book now. So we're about, she, they've, they've just gone out and they're walking down the hill. The meadow was alive with passing songbirds, the buzzing of crickets and the whirring flights of small insects that leaped before the couple as they started down the steep hill behind the house, but not after all into James pasture as they'd first intended. In the distance, Great Brook, full from the week of incessant rain, rushed over smooth granite stones and provided the cheerful background noise of running water. The scene couldn't have been more placid and idyllic. The pair watered downhill away from the farm into a more distant meadow where they thought the strawberries might be more profuse. Side by side, they bent and pushed apart the sharp green blades of grass to reveal the berries growing on vines against the ground. Nearly an hour had passed by the time they reached the rail and brush fence that Prescott and Chauncey Cochran had recently worked on. Prescott suggested that the berries on the other side of the fence were larger and easier to find and Sally Cochran's basket was still only partially filled. Cochran was encumbered by her dress and petticoats, so she elected to make the longer walk all the way around the fence and into the field. She moved ahead of Prescott, bending and searching for the berries, her fingers stained red with their juice. He paused at the opening in the fence, distracted by something he found there. She kept intently picking the berries, conscious that it was getting late now and that even though it was Sunday, many chores awaited. She'd need a full basket of berries to feed the entire family. A sudden noise just behind her drew her attention and she glanced up curiously. Prescott was now very close to her, grinning. He was not interested in the berries. Fear rising, she pushed him away. He was no longer smiling. The peril was instantly horrifically obvious to her. She dropped the basket, too frightened even to scream. He grabbed at her, her flowing skirt in easy reach. She struggled to free herself, her heart pounding in dread. As he dragged her inexorably to him, her calash came loose and tumbled to the ground, landing beside the bright red splash of her spilled basket of berries. She dodged away, hampered by her gown and petticoats, but desperate to escape. Terror flooded through her, and now her movement seemed to slow down as Prescott sped up. She twisted free again, but the deep grass made it difficult even to start to run, and he quickly gained a firmer hold on her, this time grabbing a fistful of her hair. She didn't notice the pain of the comb being torn from her hair as his swinging fist connected with the side of her head. The force of the blow more momentarily stunned her, giving him the opportunity to fling her face down onto the grass. She drew in breath to scream as she tried to scramble to her hands and knees. His face livid with fury, Prescott snatched up a four foot long rough cut wooden pole and swung it. The first blow of the post crashed down on the back of her head. The explosion of pain was instantaneously instantaneous, but mercifully dimmed as the sounds of the summer morning receded and the darkness engulfed her. <laughs>
Chauncey Cochran was deeply engrossed in Reverend Avery's troubles when his mother came to the door to tell him she was hearing a very strange noise coming from the barnyard. Maybe there was an animal in distress? He reluctantly left to investigate. As he stepped out onto the rough cut granite doorstep behind the house and looked across the dirt yard, past the well sweep toward the open barn door, he felt a little tickle of fear at the bizarre sounds that reached him, not animal, but distinctly disturbingly human. He anxiously followed the whimpering and occasional loud moaning through the barn doors, across the cool, hay-scented, dimly lit length of the large building to the shed at the far end that opened onto the lane leading downhill to the pasture. Prescott lay sprawled in the dooryard, suddenly silent now that Cochran, bewildered, loomed over him. Not seeing his wife around, Cochran's confusion swiftly turned to alarm. What are you about, Abraham? He asked, the panic rising in him as he suddenly noticed the spray of blood stains across the teen's white shirt. I have struck Mrs. Cochran with a stake, Prescott wailed. I have killed her. Stunned, Cochran demanded that the boy lead him to her. Prescott cried that he had left her in the brook field where they had gone, but he wouldn't get up to lead Cochran to his stricken young wife. When Cochran ordered him to run and show him where she lay, Prescott still refused but then with great reluctance rose and started down the lane for the field. Along the way, he offered a further halting explanation over his shoulder. While picking strawberries, he had been seized with a toothache, he said. Unable to help her find berries because of the pain, he had instead sat down on a tree stump and then somehow fallen asleep. When he awoke, he realized that he had killed her while asleep. Will you have me hanged, he wailed. I believe the devil has got full possession of you, Cochran screamed. So that the the stake, of course, was a fence post, but with, those were called stakes at that time. Wait a minute. As, as soon as Cochran got to his wife, he realized he could see that there was a trodden down area in the, the deep grass of the meadow. And Sally wasn't in that trodden down area. She was actually about 30 feet away, kind of hidden under a bunch of um, bushes. So Abraham, having beaten her over the head a couple of times with the fence post, had then dragged her still alive, seeming to you know want to conceal her body, although then he'd gone back up to the barn. So it's kind of hard to know exactly what his plan was. Um, when uh, Chauncey turned his wife over, she was still alive, and he tried to get Abraham to go for the neighbors to get help, but Abraham wouldn't go. First, he wouldn't go, and then he finally just ran off and left Chauncey there, and Chauncey just began to scream for help, and eventually the neighbors started to come, but by the time they got there, Sally had died. Um, so the neighbors didn't really know what to make of it. They could all see the trodden area in the grass, the spilled strawberries. They could see that Sally's comb was there with one tooth broken out of it and her calash lay in the grass and there was no blood on her calash uh, and it was not damaged. On the other hand, Sally had two huge deep cuts across the back of her head from the fence post that the physician, when he came, said that he could lay two or three fingers into those, like right onto her brain. Um, they, they were truly lethal injuries. And, and nowadays, if the FBI were looking at this case, they would say that there was evidence of overkill here. So that's kind of what the neighbors found. Um, Abraham had been wearing a long shirt and a vest over the shirt and then some pantaloons and his clothes were sprayed with Sally's blood. Um, a couple of the neighbors walked back up trying kind of following Abraham's tracks and eventually found him in another field where he was lying on the ground and he had taken his shirt off and the neighbor asked him why he'd taken his shirt off and he said that he had taken it off because he thought he would hang himself with it because he figured they would hang him anyway. And he was taken to that neighbor's house for the night and all evening long. Other neighbors walked through to see the kid because he was so suddenly become sort of an interesting thing to see. Um, the next morning, there was um, a brief hearing in Pembroke. And then um, Abraham was sent to the jail in Hopkinton, New Hampshire, which was 
really like the far side of Concord and was about 20 miles from Pembroke. So that was, you know, quite a long distance away. And the next day, Sally was buried in uh, the little cemetery in Pembroke, um, just several house lots up from her home and practically the next door neighbor of her parents' house. And that's her stone there. This is the building where the jail was housed in Hopkinton in, and the jail actually was put there in the very early 1800s and was there until about the 1850s. For quite a while, Hopkinton was the county seat of Merrimack County, which had been created in about 1820. And so th they had their own jail and eventually it, it, Concord became the county seat. So th there was no more need for that. I don't think the jail is still there. These people very nicely let me in to look for the jail. Um, and it, it is a very cool house, but I think the jail probably was in an L behind the house, which is gone now. And it has this newer L on the side. Um, it, life was not real pleasant in the jail. The, the jails at that point were used to, hi, to house debtors. And uh, the Hopkinton jail was also the home of an insane man that they would periodically let out to roam around just so he didn't have to stay in there all the time. Um, initially, um, Abraham was kept in leg irons, which were very uncomfortable. And eventually he tried to escape to Canada and uh, Mrs. Leach, the wife of the jailer, found him getting ready to escape somehow or another. And then he and Andrew Leach made a deal that they would take the leg irons off and he promised he wouldn't try to escape anymore. And he didn't. So he remained in the jail all summer. And then in September, he was taken to Concord to be arraigned. And while he was in Concord, he was held in the state prison there, um, which was actually a, a fairly new building. It was probably only like 20 or 30 years old at that point. Um, and while he was at the jail, a, a number of gentlemen from Pembroke came to the jail cell along with the warden of the prison to confront him because they said to him that his story of sleepwalking when killing her wasn't going to do, that nobody believed that. And Abraham basically seemed to echo back to them whatever they said to him. Um, there were obviously issues with Abraham and his mental status, even from childhood. It's difficult to know exactly what the significance of his issues were, was. Um, but basically, they, they kind of told him that, that he had a, attempted to proposition Sally and that she had rejected his, his approach. And he had become angry and so beaten her to death. And he sort of parroted all that back to them. He said that, that he had tried to say something to her. And when she rejected him, that she said that, oh, you know, Chauncey is going to be so angry with you and he's going to have you jailed. And then he claimed that he sat down on a tree stump. There's that tree stump again. And he thought about it and he realized that if he was going to be jailed anyway, he might as well kill her. And he did. So there's not a lot of logic to that. But um, if, if that story is to be believed, then after she told him that Chauncey would have him jailed, she went back to picking strawberries and he snuck up behind her and hit her with the fence post. That, that was his story. I cannot imagine that he would do that and then she would go back to picking strawberries. So at... Um, Abraham's arraignment, he had two attorneys appointed to defend him. Um, there was, the constitution provides that you are entitled to representation by an attorney. But the primary reason that the constitution says that is that in England at that time, people who wanted attorneys often were not allowed to have attorneys. So even though now, you know, if you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. In those days, it really was not automatic that you would get attorneys, but he was very fortunate and he received two attorneys. And one of them was Charles Hazen Peasley, who was 29 years old at that point and a Dartmouth graduate and been, had been practicing law for several years and was also active in politics. 
and he was um, he was local to the area. His other attorney was Ichabod Bartlett, who practiced in Portsmouth, and Portsmouth was none too close to Pembroke. Um, Ichabod Bartlett was where Peasley was at sort of the beginning of his career. Bartlett was nearing the end of his career, and Peasley seems to have done most of the legal work. And these two men um, seem to have decided that they would try the sleepwalking story, but as far as they knew, that had never been used as a defense before. And so their thought was perhaps to argue that he was insane. And I think that uh, that was probably closer to the truth. Um, so uh, Abraham was arraigned and sent back to Hopkinton. And theoretically, he would have been tried at the next meeting of the Superior Court, which wasn't scheduled until February of 1834. So he'd been now in jail since mid-June. Um, when it came time for the court to meet in February, the defense was having trouble getting some of their witnesses who were coming from fairly distant places. And so it was postponed until the next meeting of the Superior Court, which would be the following September. So now here it is a year and several months later, and finally there's going to be a trial. Um, so the trial was held in the Old North Meeting House in Concord, New Hampshire, which um, later burned down, but it was the kind of the biggest building in town, had the biggest open space, and they knew that there were going to be an awful lot of people coming to watch this. There had never been a potential death penalty case in the county of, in Merrimack County. So it was obviously going to be a big event. Um, and because it was a capital case, the jury was supposed to be sequestered for the length of the trial. Um, wait a second. And this is the Eagle Hotel. Um, and I think this is kind of around the turn of the century, this photograph. And I don't know, I'm, I don't, I'm doubting, you know, this is what comes up when you look for the Eagle Hotel. I'm doubting that this is what it looked like in 1833. That looks like an awfully significant building for me. Um, but the problem was that the jury really wasn't properly sequestered. The jury was taken to the Eagle Hotel both to eat and to sleep. But while they were there, they mingled with the other guests a number of the men went and got their hair cut. Some of them went to the post office and everywhere they went, they discussed the case. And that wasn't the only issue. Another issue was that at least one and possibly several of the jurors, all of whom were middle-aged farmers, were drinking in the jury box, they said, for their health. So the defense argued that, that Abraham had briefly become insane, just long enough to kill Sally and that the insanity had then gone off as soon as, as he finished killing her, or he had been sleepwalking, or possibly those things were almost exactly the same. He had been sleepwalking and insane. And whatever the case, um, even though a lot of people felt that Abraham didn't really look normal, he was convicted of the crime and sentenced to death. Um, as soon as the sentence came down, I mean, they had not even left the courtroom, the defense appealed and the appeal was granted because of the misbehavior of the jurors, not because of any, you know, legal argument. So um, another year went by and in September of 1835, there was a second trial. And the second trial was more or less a replay of the first trial. Um, and Abraham was convicted and sentenced to death a second time. And he was supposed to be executed in early December of 1835 in Hopkinton. And on the day that was set for his execution, thousands of people turned up in Hopkinton to watch the execution. And when they got there, they found out that there had been a little tiny letter in the newspaper just um, a day before postponing the execution while the governor considered the defense's last, um, really their last option for saving Abraham's life. 
they were so desperate to do that, that both the justices at the trial and the attorneys had all signed a letter that had appeared in the Concord newspaper arguing that something was wrong with Abraham, something that made him incompetent and thus unable to, to have, you know, thought out the murder. Um, so the governor didn't, even though he was, uh, had actually run on a platform of being opposed to the death penalty, he didn't want to make a decision on his own because there was a lot of feeling about um, Abraham. I mean, you, you, you can't forget he had murdered the young mother of, of two small children. Um, it was just so brutal and, and she had trusted him and everything. I mean, there were so many aspects to this case that were really, really dreadful. So the governor kind of like didn't really want to go out on a limb and, and, and decide that maybe Abraham wasn't responsible. So he referred it to his counsel and they talked it over for a few days and they kind of felt the same way. He had after all been judged guilty by two different juries and, you know, how, how could those juries be wrong? Which they quite likely were. So eventually the council told the governor that they thought that he should be executed and his execution date was reset for early January of 1836. And when the appointed day arrived, it was in the midst of a heavy snowstorm and 10,000 people came to Hopkinton, which isn't close to anywhere. I mean, it's, it's about 20 miles from Manchester, which now is a good sized town. But in 1836, the, the mills were just beginning to open in Manchester. And I think the population was something like a thousand. I mean, the whole state of New Hampshire didn't have too much more than 100,000 in population. So to have 10,000 people show up there to watch this execution was really remarkable. Um, the day before he was to be executed, a reporter came to talk to Abraham from a Boston newspaper. And this man reported that Abraham said, well, he hadn't really propositioned Sally, that what it was is that he had decided that if he killed Sally and Chauncey, that he would inherit their farm. And so his plan was to kill Sally and then to lure Chauncey down to the same field and then kill him too. Or so the reporter reported. I, you know, I don't know whether that's an, you know, whether that, a plan like that would have been beyond Abraham's skills to come up with. And I also don't know whether he would ever have been so foolish as to think that he would a, get away with it, and B, then end up with their farm. It seems very improbable to me. So um, in Hopkinton, they've kind of forgotten that they ever had an execution there. Um, and it, it wasn't easy to try to find out where that happened. But it was described as being in an amphitheater-like field. And I was able to sort of trace deeds back and it appears to have been a field that eventually became the Beach Hill Golf Club in Hopkinton, New Hampshire, and now is a town recreation area. And they had constructed a uh, gallows there between two huge standing stones, which are now gone. Um, a popular idea at the time was to have a, a condemned man ride to his execution sitting on his coffin. Well, they didn't do that with Abraham. Um, they were using sleighs because it was snowing and I don't think there was room in the sleigh to put him on top of his coffin. So his coffin was in a separate sleigh, but he was taken to the gallows and um, he had made an arrangement with the executioner that, that he, you know, they, when he was all fastened up and his face covered and everything like that, that he would drop his handkerchief and then they would swing the, um, the door on the bottom of the gallows. Well, poor Abraham dropped his handkerchief and they weren't ready to launch him. And so they gave it back to him and he had to go through all of that a second time. He had told people before his execution that his, his biggest fear was that his body would be dissected. And um, somebody representing the family took his body off after he had hung there the you know required half hour and that he was dead. And nobody really knows now where he was buried. <laughs>
Meanwhile, in 1834, the summer after Sally was murdered, Chauncey Cochran packed up his two children. He left his mother behind. He sold the family farm, so she probably went to live with her son James across the street. And he moved to East Corinth, Maine, which is just north of Bangor. Um, he bought a house that was already there. He married again about three years later to the daughter of one of the men that was on the first jury for his, his wife's murder. And they had about eight children. And of those eight children, I, I think this is um, Chauncey standing on the side of the house there, the older looking guy. Of the eight children, only one of them ever married and he actually relocated to Sacco. And late in his life, he married to a younger woman who had a daughter and a son. And um, Chauncey must have passed the, the uh, sampler down to the, the son. And the son had a daughter. And she ended up with the sampler. And um, she was born years after Chauncey was, was dead, had died. The story didn't come with the sampler and the members of the Cochran family that still live here in Saco were unfamiliar with the story. They didn't know that this had happened to Sally. Um, it was very popular at the time to have either a record of trial published after a, after a case like this because people would buy it, you know, and read it and it was a way to make some money off of the whole thing. Or sometimes there was a broadside and in the case of Abraham Prescott, there was both a record of the first trial and a broadside. So this is the broadside and there are just a few copies of it still around, but this one is from the collection in um, at Dartmouth. And it's you know pretty graphic with the coffin at the top there. And it's just this incredibly maudlin poem. Why did I kill that happy wife? Why did I bruise her head? Anyway. Um, so in the end, we circle back around to Sally's sampler. And one of the interesting things about Sally's sampler is this little verse at the bottom of it here that says, each moment has its sickle and cuts down the fairest bloom of sublunary bliss. Well, in the 1920s, a couple of ladies who were in the, um, oh God, my mind has gone blank, just a minute. Mm, it'll come to me. Well, anyway, they they were very interested in preserving schoolgirl embroideries. And one of the things that they, they, they and their group did is they went around looking at all the samplers that they could find and writing down their verses. And they published a book called American Samplers. And in it are literally hundreds and hundreds of verses you know, surely all of the most common ones. Well, this verse is not in there. This may be the only sampler that has this verse on it, which is a particularly grim verse. And I assume that Sally was referring to her, um, her little sisters that had died before her and not, you know, obviously not thinking about her own grave. Um, and this finally is, if you should happen to go over to Pembroke and, Eventually, the, the developer that was trying to build the, the subdivision there on the land failed, and the town took the land for the taxes that were owed. <clears throat> and it's become a kind of like a little nature preserve. And you can walk down into the woods. And if you look and you look and you look, you will find this granite monument that stands on the site of where Sally was killed. So let me just escape and stop share. And there you all are.